Um, thank you all for coming. It's an honor for me to be here. Um, today is the scariest talk I've ever given, I realized. It has a large range of audience, and a lot of you are really, really smart, if not all, because I, I don't know all of you. Um, and you have such a large range of background, it's basically impossible to gauge what you know and what you don't know. And it's worse talk for me to give them a job talk at Berkeley, just to let you know. So if it doesn't make any sense, it's probably my fault. Also, I only had five hours of sleep last night because I was up preparing for it. So feel free to raise your hand and press the speaker button. I think that's like on your seat to ask questions any point of the talk. I know this is a little bit uncommon to do it this way, but I figure if you have a question, it's likely that the person next to you is going to have the same questions. Um, so feel free to ask questions anytime. All right. And I'm going to take it away, so starting with um, this talk. The title today is The First AI Simulation of the Universe. And I will claim that it's fast and accurate, and we don't know why. And it's going to be the outline of the talk today, because it's the three things that we're going to talk about. is how it's fast, it's accurate, and we actually don't know why it worked, which is very strange. Um, <laughs> so it's a bit scary. And I'm going to talk about you know, why it is important to get these simulations first and then talk about how this machine learning, this artificial intelligence uh, candidates, I would say, these deep learning techniques that are you know, promised or people think they might be able to lead us to artificial general intelligence. These methods called deep learning methods are used to make these universes really, really fast. But let's take a look at the universe. This is what you'll see if you fly out from Earth and just see all these real, these are real galaxies collected by the Sloan Digital Sky Survey Telescope. That's why it's fuzzy, because it's not simulated. They are actual real galaxies that you look up in the sky through a telescope in Apache Point Observatory in New Mexico. And you see this structure of the universe that you slowly kind of see. It's kind of cosmic web structure, like, and kind of like the spider web. And all these red dots are these red luminous galaxies that are very old. The different colors of the galaxy is just really telling us about properties of the galaxy, also where it is in time. We're kind of flying out from Earth. And it's going back and forth in this just to show you the structure of the universe here is actually teaching you something about the universe. Those are all galaxies. Those are all real galaxies. Not That's actually a very smart question. So Jim just mentioned that we're not seeing through the Milky Way or something. Um, because actually, this is a question I want to ask people. Right here, let me try to pause this. <coughs> nope, not this. So there is a certain chunk of the screen that you don't see anything. So for those who are not an astronomers, if you can guess why do we actually have empty spaces in the universe that don't have a bunch of galaxies? Part of this, yes? Is there some guesses over here? Exactly. So Jim was like, we don't see the Milky Way because the Milky Way will have blocked it out. So the telescope deliberately don't look at it. And that's why you have these empty spaces. And um, that's why. And Jim, that's why you saw there's this huge empty spaces. Any other reasons other than the Milky Way blocking it? I usually offer a drink or coffee for those who have got the right answer. But there's free coffee outside. So I think that doesn't work. Gases? Yes, dust, dust is a lot in the Milky Way, which is also why that was the case. Yes. Hasn't been surveyed yet? Sorry? Hasn't been surveyed yet? That's another possibility. I haven't been surveyed. You have a lot of good guesses here. N astronomers cannot guess. If you don't know the reason why you're astronomers, you should talk to an observer friend of yours. Yes. <laughs> because the, the universe has been shown to have a structure where uh, you know, galaxies congregate around certain regions, but not others. So, so there's some clustering, like you know, galaxy cl clustering, but um, not in this particular reason. But there's some clustering to it. I, I'll take one more guess. <laughs> not for this one. Dark matter might do many things, but I don't know where this one will work. But this is this is all great. We can take more suggestions later. Um, there is also the fact that the telescope cannot look into the ground. Easy stuff <laughs> like that just can't point to the ground because can't see through. This telescope does not see through Earth. There are other telescopes like Neutrino's telescope that can see through Earth, not this one. So there are many things that you can learn from this. But the fact that there is a structure here actually would look differently if the universe component is different. So I'm going to talk about what the universe component is next up. 
So what do we know about this universe? Our universe circa 1900, 100% 100 baryonic matter. What's baryonic matter? Just like normal everyday stuff, pro stuff that made up of neutrons and protons, 100%. And you know, stuff like, pretty stuff like this that we can observe with NASA. And at 1970s, we realized that we're losing this baryonic matter in the fraction of the universe. Because only 15% of the universe is baryonic matter, the normal everyday stuff, you, me, the stuff that made up the table. There's 85% of something kind of mysterious called dark matter. And you're like, what the heck is dark matter? I did not swear on this word, good. Um, here is an image of what the dark matter is doing. It's kind of strange. Dark matter is this matter that we think interacts gravitationally, but not any other ways, which means it warps the space. It also interacts with the stuff that actually has mass. And if there's a bunch of light in the background, it will go through these you know, regions that are warped by the dark matter and get warped to form this nice image, this smiley face that's actually not photoshopped into space. It's a real smiley face in the space smiling back at you. So I thought that's a cool strong lensing image. It's strongly gravitationally lensed by dark matter, this extra matter that does not get accounted for by just the galaxy's mass there. So we know there's extra matter that interacts gravitationally, just like masses interact, but it doesn't shine at all. So that's what creates this strong gravitational lensing that tells us that there is extra matter. That's not just everyday matter. And our universe now, so my uh, ex-dean keeps telling us that cosmologists keep losing stuff <laughs> as they would give them more money to build more telescopes. Um, so you remember, you know, in 1900, we didn't have much money to build any telescope. We have some telescopes. We have all the baryon matter. It's 100% of the universe. Then we lost some. It becomes 15%. Now it's 5%. So build more telescope, we lost more stuff. Jim, I'm not sure you should give us any money sometimes <laughs> <laughs> to build any telescope. Well, we then, the baryonic matter is only 5%. And 27% is dark matter. And this is 68% is kind of mysterious dark energy. And you're like, what is dark energy? That's kind of all I know. It's blank. It's basically a term that characterizes our ignorance of what's going on in the universe. There is an accelerated expansion of the universe that is not expected within the framework of Einstein's general relativity. But if you think Einstein's theory of gravity is wrong, and I think he's quite smart, I would say, you know, either you think he's wrong or you have to add this extra mysterious stuff called dark energy. So we're all trying to figure out what that is. And so I would argue that the nature of this mysterious material is called dark matter or dark energy <laughs> may be the most two, interesting, two most interesting questions, maybe, in physics today, but arguably two most expensive ones, and I'll explain why. One is, I don't know, anyone recognize the picture here? Wow, let's grab this one. Yeah, so everyone recognizes. So we have a, see, you guys are a really smart audience. That's why I think the talk is gonna be really tough today. Um, great questions will also be tough sometimes. And these are built to look for dark matter and also test the standard model of physics. But looking for dark matter, searching for it is one of the major goals and it costs billions of euros. And we also build these telescopes or will build this telescope. This is W first telescope. You actually should ask David more about this than I do know. It's uh, the telescope that NASA would like to build in a few years and will cost also somewhat upward to a billion dollars or more. It's looking also for dark energy and dark matter and also exoplanets and other worlds. So I would argue that these are fairly expensive questions that we want to answer. Once this telescope collects this data about the universe, the beautiful data you saw earlier, you're asking yourself, well, how do we analyze this data that costs billions of dollars properly, right? So what do we do every day? So that's what I did back then. We compress this amazing you know, image that has petabytes of data with lots of galaxies, millions of galaxies. All the galaxies have a bunch of information in it into these very simple summary statistics of the universe. Um, what I'm showing you here is a plot that's probably incomprehensible for most of the audience. But what I'm showing is um, a correlation function of the universe galaxies. If there's a galaxy here, what's the excess probability of finding another galaxy friend over there 
of certain distance away. The distance plotted at the x distances, and the y is sort of the power at expressed in different way. One is the monopole on top, the quadruple in the bottom, for those who are more interested in the theory here. And W here is showing you some properties of dark energy. We call it equation of state of dark energy. And you can see that if you change the equation of state of dark energy, which is this weird properties of this mysterious dark energy, you will change the summary statistics of the universe. They compress from this you know, cosmic web into basically 40 numbers. Okay? Once it compresses into 40 numbers, we can put constraints on dark energy by using you know, multiple experiments there and also from this experiment. And what I'm plotted over there is the constraints on this mysterious dark energy on two different parameters that describes this equation of state. Some certain properties for those who don't really think about it too often, but it has some time dependence in it. So now I'm gonna pause because there's a lot of you know, things I just threw to you guys. This is basically the bread and butter of astronomical or cosmological analysis today. Right, so that's what we do. I just gave you basically what the grad school first year 101 cosmology data analysis in three minutes. Any questions? <laughs> yes. Do you want to use the mic? I think now people might want to hear your question. So that's a. Uh, uh, is, is that showing that the constraints from, from different sources are not matching up though? Well, they, I wouldn't say they're not matching up. There's different experiments. So the top is something called the cosmic microwave background experiment. It's sort of the baby picture of the universe of the microwave background that tells you the sort of more primordial fundamental parameters of the universe. The second one is plus BAO. BAO is a baron classic oscillation. It's a summary statistics, which is actually exactly this bump here that I show here that gives you the constraint of the um, properties of dark energy. And then there's also something called the supernova. Here is the supernova uh, components here too, which is uh, the exploding stars that actually tells you also the distances very well. Once you get the distance right, you can map basically out the properties of the expansion of the universe. And, and what are the two axes in the first? The first one? So the, the whole thing is the correlation function of the galaxies or matter field of the universe. The top panel is the monopole. The bottom panel is the quadrupole. So the top panel is just basically the average power of, if you have a galaxy here, what's the excess probability of finding another galaxy over there? Or you can think of it as histogram of number counts of galaxies, pairs in different distances. And that's the distance between the two galaxies. More questions? Yes. Can you use the mic? Because I want to hear you otherwise. Thank you. This is practice for mic using for the questions. Yeah, right. Um, the um, upper right hand quadrant has nothing in it. Uh, it just happened that it's this uh, way. Sure. Um, the three different data sets, you know, the first one is the cosmic microwave background, which is the baby picture of the universe when it first born, basically. The second one is this, you know, basically this cosmic web I just showed you, plus exploding stars. The third one is also what this uh, cosmic web actually showed you earlier, plus something called weak gravitational lensing. You saw the earlier version of smiley face called strong gravitational lensing, where the light's getting bent by the, basically, gravity. And now this is a weaker version, which happens everywhere. So we're combining all these different um, astronomical, cosmological probes to understand the uh, basically the mysterious dark energy. So that's what we do. This is Cosmology 101 in 10 minutes. I think I did pretty well. For grads, definitely grad level. <laughs> Any other questions here? Can you use the mic, please? I can't hear you, but. The graph that shows the constraints and dark energy, mm -hmm. can you tell us uh, more explicitly what the two axes are? And also, can you tell us what is the equation of state? Yeah, so we know very little about dark energy. So we want to parameterize it in certain ways. So you can take a ratio between the pressure and the density. And that's sort of what we're looking at in the equation of state of dark energy. And then you can characterize it as a function of time. 
So that's what these two axes we're talking about. So maybe there's some changes in time, you know, in dark energy as a function of time. But in this case, we don't see any. That's why it's zero on the WA. Cool. This is very difficult question, but it's good. So now the question is, can I do better than what we've done before, right? So I basically got tenure at Carnegie Mellon because I did sort of this kind of work and play some constraints on you know, dark energy, something small problems like that. And then I said, well, can I do something different? Because once you get tenure, tend to do something a little bit crazy or different, depending how you look at it. Um, about the same time, Carnegie Mellon is very good at machine learning. So I met a bunch of friends at different parties and they tell me about these things about machine learning. And that was about 2011, when that happened, 2012. And I was kind of skeptical, just like David. I wasn't sure. It wasn't working 2011, by the way. 2012, when it starts to really work. So we did a bunch of work and realized nothing really worked. It's training really slowly. There's a bunch of things that may be OK. And in 2016, you probably heard about this, which is um, machine learning um, from DeepMind algorithm has beaten the best Go player in the world by using machine learning that plays against itself. So this machine just trains itself to play Go, and it beats the best Go player in the world in like an open competition. So that was 2016 as a Nature paper. Here is the five human Joseki common corner sequences that was discovered by the machine itself during training, when it's training itself. So you're not reading a, like, a little book where you usually learn chess or Go. It just kind of discovered it by itself. So I thought that's kind of interesting. And at 2012, I already got fairly intrigued. And we started working on things related to machine learning. And then for those who are more interested in biology, I don't know if you've heard of uh, proteins folding. Um, the ability to predict the protein shape is very useful to scientists because it's fundamental to understanding its role within the body as well as diagnosing whether you know, or treating diseases believed to be caused by misfolding of proteins, such as Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, or cystic fibrosis. So people care a lot about how to fold proteins. And every year, there's a competition. The problem is follows. You're given like, basically sequences of amino acids, and you try to predict the shape that no one has published it before. So you cannot guess what the shape is by looking at you know, a bunch of literature. You just have to somehow figure it out. So the recent 2019 competitions, everyone in the world who cares about protein folding came together. And out of 43 proteins, the second best competitor got three correct. While the winner, which is uh, the Google DeepMind team, actually had got 25 out of 43 right. And they only used deep learning. So they weren't you know, using traditional method of what people use in protein folding. And I thought, that's pretty cool. And that's what they found out. This is an animation of the gradient descent method, which is basically a search to find the right solution um, to predicting the structure of this particular target that was never published before. So it kind of like struggled to find it where it is the right shape, and it goes back, goes to it. This is a looping video. That's why you keep seeing it opening and going to the right shape. And I thought, this is pretty important. Right? This is actually a making science going forward instead of just playing video games, which is also very good at deep learning. Then the next thing is a little bit more, uh, I guess you can think of it either as defense contract or Amazon delivery. This is about landing drones in very difficult conditions. Um, they actually, you don't see it, but there's a fan blowing really hard, and the drone is about to land. This is work by Caltech, uh, led by the group by Anima Anakuma, who's uh, also NVIDIA's uh, research director. Um, it's coming down. It's controlled by humans right now, okay? This is humans, the best drone lander. Complex turbulence between the rotors and the ground makes the landings very slow and bumpy. It's actually taking its time trying to figure out how, and it's bumping, right? And an EMS group has figured out how to land it much better. So let's see how they do that using machine learning without no humans landing it. It's actually better than a normal human or a best drone lander person. It's just like smoothly going very quickly, and it's much faster. And mentioning that there's a lot of wind actually blowing, which you don't see. So I thought that was actually very interesting in machine learning application. That worked really well. Um, another thing I want to show you is something you probably all recognize on your Facebook or any image recognition on you know, Google when you take a photo. It says this is probably your kid or your friend or your parents or whoever. 
um, they actually do really well. Uh, they, in 2016, this particular algorithm called residual neural nets has won the competition of detecting images in context. They run a competition every year. They detect common objects in context. So they actually are giving you a probability what everything is with this label. And you can see that it's doing very well given such a complex image using machine learning. And we're actually going to use a very similar algorithm later on, also called residual neural net, but a different shape called UNet later on in our analysis, which I'll show you later. Um, so I'll pause here because I just went through a bunch of machine learning um, progresses later recently and ask if there are any questions. Yes, please. I wouldn't say it's a preferable black box. It's a bunch of you know linear or nonlinear functions and convolutions. They are actually just math, I would say. But mo a lot of things are just math. <laughs> I I wouldn't say that because a lot of people, a huge group right now. I mean, not I shouldn't say huge, but huge and more and more people are more interested in how to interpret the network. And a lot of times, very simple network is actually quite easy to understand. Our network is actually not very hard to understand. There are people who like to do the best you know, performance and go really complex network architecture, and that's harder to understand. But you have like a couple layers of neural net is actually fairly easy to understand. Yeah. People like to use the word black box. I think it's because of the business solutions thing. Like you want to sell them something that is really hard to code up by yourself, so they call it a black box sometimes. That's my theory. Yeah. Um, any other questions? All right. I guess the, this audience knows the machine learning side for sure. So remember what we want to do, what we used to do, and we still do actually to analyze the data. But what we actually wanted in my head after reading all this machine learning stuff is to full-blown comparison between what we observe, these like billion dollar experiments, and what we can predict with the universe. Or you can flip it this way and think of it as any time that you cannot express your theory other than a simulation. So your theoretical predictions can have to be expressed by full-blown simulations to extract all the information of your observed, whatever observable you have. So for me, it's the universe. For you, it could be something else. Um, so, but then generating one single universe with all the necessary physics is very expensive, especially for a large volume, because all the necessary physics is very complex. A single, only gravity, so I don't include all the other physics, just gravity, dark matter only, just matter, of reasonable chunk of the universe takes about 1.8 million CPU seconds. You're like, oh, it's just 1.8 million CPU seconds, not that much. But I need a lot of them because I need to explore all the parameter space that are you know, cosmological parameters, like what is dark matter, how much dark matter there is, how much dark energy there is, what is the property of dark energy. How about these ghost particles called neutrinos that you've probably heard of before? There's a bunch of them going through your fingers every single second and you don't feel them. All these things you want to explore, not to mention the astrophysics side of things, which are including you know, galaxy, how galaxies form, whether you know, a supernova blowing up here will affect what we observe from the galaxy. And all that combined, you have to explore all that parameter space. So you need a lot of them. And I also want to estimate the accuracy of our you know, constraints. And that will also require looking at these different large number of simulations. So it's deep learning to rescue. You're like, OK, why are we doing this? Um, we want a full-blown comparison between the observed universe and our predictions, which in this case is simulation. We want to do it really, really fast because otherwise we can't do it. So that brings up the question, can we use deep learning to simulate the universe as fully as possible? So as fully as possible is difficult. Shai, who's in the audience, Shai Janelle, who's a associate research scientist here who just raised his hands, can tell you way more about these simulations than I do. But they make this simulation about the universe is a small chunk of it, but it includes a lot of the physics, or most of it. That's a supernova, I think, exploding right there. Yes, it's showing the gas temperature of um, the structure in the universe right now. This is time since the Big Bang is 4.5 billion years right now here. And you can see that there's gravity involved, there's hydrodynamics involved, gas interacting, explosion of stars again. 
and you know metals forming when i say metals could be like gold or platinum or iron all kinds of uh, metal and it's very complex and this simulation costed 30 million cpu hours to make correct yes shy just nodded to me so we can't make 30 million cpu hours simulation you know um, several thousand times would be very expensive even like expensive for me at least and so what are we going to do so instead of trying to immediately, you know, create the best simulation on Earth to observe the universe, and also it is a small box of the universe, we'll try to do something a little bit simpler and just look at the matter only side, the dark matter simulation. The reason I would do that, and it's only gravity only, because it actually forms the backbone. It might not be obvious, but this forms the backbone of the universe. So things are fluffy and blowing up on the other side, but the backbone is still more or less intact. Where the galaxy sits are probably still in the same spot, even though they might move a tiny bit because of all these uh, explosions and quasars turning on and off and stuff like that. So we're going to basically create the gravity simulations first. The reason is all things interact through gravity. It forms the backbone of the universe. We're going to mo model the gravity interactions first with only the massive particles interacting gravitationally with dark energy included. So this is quite complex already. So here's our experiment. We use steep learning to simulate the universe for the gravity-only simulations with matter particles, including dark energy, OK? So it's not all the physics that we love, but it's part of it. The input is analytical approximation of the cosmic structure of the universe. Time equals to now. This is our input. OK, I'm going to pause a tiny bit. Does it make some sense? This is what theorists can write down pa pen and paper quickly okay, of what we should see now in the universe. The output is we want positions and velocities of all the particles evolved under gravity until now, after some number of years. Time equals to now also. Instead of running you know, numerical simulations of Newton's law for all the particles, we we'll attempt to basically use deep learning to learn or interpolate from a large number of pre-run simulations. OK, let me see if I lose anyone here. Questions? Yes, in the back. Yeah, try to use the button if you can. Possible to return to the outputs um, slide. Would it be possible to what? Re return to the outputs. To return to the output? Uh, the slide. Oh, yeah. yes. Slide back. It's the positions and velocities of all the particles after it falls under gravity after some number of years to now, basically. The input is what theorists can write down quickly, basically, on paper and pencil without running any simulations. OK, so that's what we want to do. Input basically takes no time. Output, positions and velocities, all the particles evolve under gravity after many, many years. OK? Do you give it, do you give the inputs like uh, velocity vectors and like different forces to predict the output? Or is it, as you said, just skeletal, uh, like a skeletal backbone with the matter? Well, well I will show you the training set, but the input does not give velocities. Yeah. What yes. Um, so I was actually about to use the science term, but it's okay. It's uh, about uh, 256 megaparsec on the side. One megaparsec is about 3 million light years. So I have to do some calculations here. So the number of dimensions in, the, in, the, in, the, in terms of the number of inputs that go into a deep learning. Oh, yeah. So it's about 256 cube on the side, on the input. And output is the same size. So that was easy. But we did 128 cube, 256 cube, it all worked. And 512 cube, actually. Cool. So instead of using numerical simulations, going back, of Newton's law of all the particles, we will attempt to use deep learning to interpolate or learn from a large number of pre-run simulations. So it's basically asking the deep learning method to learn what Newton's laws had done to all these particles over that number of years. So that's what it's trying to do. Does that make sense? Yes? So you're not using general relativity, just Newton's law. 
just Newton's law for these simulations because at these scales it doesn't really matter. We don't really we don't really put in the black holes and see how it interacts in strong gravity level. Yeah. So these pre-run simulations that you're training the sun are they based on the same approach or different approaches um, to um, if you're So the training set and the test set are completely separate, if you, that's what you're asking. How are the pre-run simulations done? The pre-run simulations run with numerical simulations with oh, no. Newton's, Newton's law. So they don't do ML at all. So it's like typical you know, simulations I would run before I know about ML. OK, so what we want is inputs is analytical approximations, what you can write down, what theorists can write down quickly. The output is numerical, basically simulated fields. Okay, and machine learning models in the middle, which I'm about to s discuss what they are. Um, this work was published uh, last year in Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, and my student who graduated was actually leading the work. So blame it on me if it's wrong. She actually did all the work with the collaborator. So that's our training set. We have 8,000 pairs of analytical and uh, simulated 3D boxes for training. What it means is that for each pair, they have the same initial condition of the universe, that the same fundamental cosmological parameters, like how much dark matter there is, how much dark energy there is. And you have 8,000 pairs of them. And we want basically, so we have 8,000 pairs of these. We want input like this and output like that. So input is approximation. Output is these numerical fields that we would have to run our simulations with otherwise. What is the machine learning model? You remember the picture I showed you earlier? Yes, you have a question representations of those graphics or the images themselves? They're the 3D images themselves. Yeah, but this is a great question. But these are all 3D boxes. 3D images are the inputs to train. Okay? And the machine learning model is something called UNet. It's a slight variant of the residual neural net we talked about earlier, where you remember you recognize the faces of all these people with like 90% a person, 85% a knife, 20%, like 80% cake, all that recognition. That was residual neural net that came out 2016. We used a variant of that called UNet, which is just a U shape of that. Residual just means that it jumps from one layer to another. You can make that jump. It can, the network can choose to jump it. And here, what it does is that you have inputs, which are these like big boxes of simulated universes, of the numerical, uh, not the numerical field, of the approximated field. And then it actually gets shrunk in spatial dimension it gets conformed and actually t multiply with some nonlinear evolution, nonlinear uh, functions, and it gets smaller. It can kind of got condensed right down here, and gets expanded to the same shape again, the same size. But it will have, hopefully, learned something, which is basically the fact that the analytical approximation for the two particles they interact with each other, it will just go through each other. But if gravity is correct when it's correctly implemented, then the two parts get close, they will interact with each other. So that's what the deep learning is trying to learn. When two particles comes, it will actually interact with each other. Because the input itself right now does not include that part. Does that make sense? Yes, OK. And that's the output we want. And let's check how well we do, right? So I didn't actually say how well we're doing yet. Still haven't started my title, you realized. Um, why well explain what the simulation of the universe is, I guess? It's fast and accurate, and we don't know how it worked. So let's check what is accurate first. Um, how accurate are these deep learned generated simulations? So we're cutting to the chase immediately. We're showing the error bar here on the right hand of left hand side. Um, if it's blue, it's really, really good, which means there's no error. The higher it goes, it maximizes at 5 megaparsec over H. One megaparsec over H is about 4.5 million light years for those who are, you know, do this kind of analysis. We use this um, megaparsec very often because it's much easier to realize you know, how big the universe is. We'll show the errors in displacement field predicted by our benchmark model and our ML model. The benchmark model is what basically everyone uses to make fast numerical simulation of the universe. It's called TLPT because it stands for second order Lagrangian perturbation theory. Um, displacement field is just the difference between the current position of the particle to the initial position of the particle. So let's see how the benchmark does. 
So that's the benchmark. It didn't do badly, right? So it has a bunch of blue, which is good, it's zero. But the maximum error there is actually seven megaparsec over edge. So this remember number seven. It's pretty large, because it's like seven times five. So it's like 30 um, million light years, basically. That's like the largest one, and that's the red ones right there. And it actually depends on whether it is in a high density region. If it's in a high density region of the universe, it will have a larger error. That's our method. It's mostly blue. The maximum error is 0.7 megaparsec over H. So it's about a factor of 10 better. And this is comparing to the fast approximation scheme that people are using currently. So we beat the fast approximation scheme by a factor of 10, and we actually even faster. But it, it's, it's not that slow either, the normal benchmark method. So let's do a little bit more quantitatively. I know this crowd might be like, OK, this is 541. We might not want to do so many slides or so many equations. But I promise there are only three equations ever in this talk. So let's do that. And it's not too bad. Um, so we compute it. We want to be quantitative and check how well our simulated universes work. Um, the first thing we did is to look at the average PAL spectrum of 1,000 simulations we generated with this machine learning algorithm. Um, what is PAL spectrum? It's just the Fourier transform of the correlation function we I mentioned a couple times before. Correlation function is just, if there's a blob here, it's a more excess probably finding another blob x distance away. Fourier transform that, that's the PAL spectrum. That was the equation there. Hopefully I didn't lose half the audience yet. Then the next thing is that I just take that PAL spectrum and divide it by the true. So that's just a division. We call it transfer function here, just for fun. And then we also look at the cross-correlation coefficient in the bottom, which it looks at how well the two fields correlate with each other. Right? So the more correlated they are, the better it is. But actually, in the bottom, we're going to plot something which is 1 minus r squared, which is basically like the error power spectrum, how much error it is. So the less, the better. For this one, the closer to the truth is better, so 1 is better than the rest. And for the top, you want basically the truth to be very similar to our machine learning model if you're rooting for our team. All right, so here's our method. It's not too bad, right? So this is the power spectrum. You want to concentrate on the truth of the simulation, which is the gray line, which you can barely see compared to the green line, which is our machine learning method. I don't know if you people can see from here. The long dash green line is basically impossible to read. The benchmark model is down here. If you look at the division of the power spectrum of the green line to the gray line, which is the truth, so as close to one as possible, basically all the way down to only a tiny bit here. So it did really, and the benchmark model is what people usually use right now, and that's the one I show you just now. And for the error power spectrum, right here, you can see that we're doing really well compared to the benchmark. And the x-axis here is the scale, which means small scale going to the right, large scale is going to the left, because it's in Fourier space. I should have mentioned that earlier. All right, so you're like, OK, this is confusing. Any questions here? I'm going to pause. I think I lost half the audience to yawning, but that's OK. <laughs> I won't throw any chalk. That's why they don't equip speakers with chalk, because that's why we try to do this. My undergrad, well, I shouldn't say that, but undergrad professors have done it before to us. Kind of wakes up the students. All right, no questions? Probably lost them. Yes, there's a question in the back, yes. Did you use um, a dropout function to reduce the overfitting? We didn't actually end up using dropout. At the beginning of the training, we did, but not this one. Yeah. There's a huge debate on whether we should do dropout or not in the field right now. So, so that's a longer discussion, <laughs> yes. Related to that, uh, any regularization? Sorry, say that again. Any other means of, of, of uh, imposing the principle of Occam's razor? I, I, I no, we didn't do the Occam razor stuff. Uh, for our different work that we have done recently, we have imposed Occam razor to find the physical equations in a system that we observed with the machine learning method. So we used the machine to look at some data set, and we actually had imposed Occam razor to find the physical equation. In this case, it was like the solar system. So we look at solar system data, and we apply Occam razor rule, and with the machine learning method, we actually found the Newton's law. So it wasn't so bad. But it was hard to find the uh, general relativistic correction because the correction is so small. 
Uh, any other question? I saw some hands. Nope. All right, yes. So as far as I'm aware, uh, units, at least the units that I've dealt with, work on two-dimensional data, or like image data with two dimensions in the channels. How did you <laughs> sort of use three-dimensional data? So uh, this is actually the work we've done that we actually had to create our 3D unit. So at that point, when we were working on it, there was no 3D unit. But I think now that people have been able to do the 3D unit. Yeah, but when we were doing it, we had to create our own 3D unit system that was all basically 2D back in the days. Back in the days it really means like 2000, I don't know, 18. <laughs> <laughs> like the time here changes very differently. So, and how fast are these simulations? So of these 1000 simulations, it was predicted in 30 seconds. One training simulation that we used took 1.8 million CPU seconds. So it's about 60 time millions 60 million times faster. So I thought that was pretty cool. Yes. Um, how big a system did you do it on? We train it on one GPUs, believe it or not. <laughs> so it's very cheap. <laughs> All right. So the first AI simulation in the universe is fast. I hope I convinced you. I mean, we generate a thousand simulations with 30 seconds, while the usual one is like 1.8 million CPU seconds. It's accurate with all these different plots you probably get really bored of. But if the one that you realize is that when it compared to the benchmark that's really fast, it's already 10 times better, even compared to the benchmark. And compared to the truth, it was basically at 1% level at something called k goes to 1, which I think is very impressive. So we are now asking ourselves, you know, we are able to, can we do this now, right? We compare the universe that we observed to a bunch of different predictions. That's like, okay, you can generate these simulations really fast. Are we ready to go? Right, can we do this now? Question is, it's a little bit more difficult than that. We need simulations of universe of different latent parameters. Remember we mentioned how each one of these are like different cosmological parameters or astrophysical parameters, like you know how galaxies are blown up by supernova or gas being pushed out differently, or how much dark matter is different, how much dark energy is different there. So this is actually not so easy because we need simulations of universes of different latent parameters, but we train this machine learning model with only one set of simulations. Latent parameter like how much dark matter there is in the universe or how much dark energy there is in our case. Yeah. It's some um, parameters that we don't observe immediately. So they have to be derived. Cool. Okay. So, but as I was saying earlier, we train this machine with only one set of simulation and they're all of the same latent parameters which means they all have the same amount of dark matter, the same amount of dark energy, the same amount of neutrinos, okay? So we don't expect this model to be able to predict universes of different amount of dark matter. Okay, I'm gonna pause right there, right? So right now we have 8,000 pairs of these 3D boxes that were training set, and the dark matter density parameters was, was 0.3, which basically means there's 30% dark matter in this universe of all the 8,000 of them. Okay? Well, 8,000 times 2, so 16,000. Can we model, can the model simulate universes with latent parameters that are different from the training set? So for the machine learning people here will be like, this is crazy because you're asking it to generate something that it wasn't trained on. Right? It's basically asking, say, if you have a classifying problem, which means you want to say if it's a zebra or a horse. So you have a bunch of pictures, zebra or horse, you can classify them. But now I throw away an elephant. You're expecting the model to say that this is an elephant. That's what I'm asking the machine to do. A little bit not so, because elephant is still somewhat close with four legs, I guess. And this is true, too. We're asking the machine right now, we're just trying to do it for fun and see what it works, to have inputs that have dark matter density parameter of 0.1 to 0.5, which means there are 10% of, uh, of dark matter or 50% dark matter instead of 30 in our inputs. The model is still trained with 30% dark matter training sets. Okay? And this actually works for like other parameters too, not just the dark matter one. And you're like, well, maybe it doesn't change the field so much, right? So what does changing dark matter density parameter really mean? 
on the top column is a density field. The bottom column is something called a displacement that we mentioned earlier. And the dark matter density parameters is 30% dark matter, 10%, and 50%. And the color here means the differences. And here is the basically fractional difference. So when you go to 50% dark matter, you're talking about you know, 20% differences in both the displacement field and the density field. And when you go to 10% dark matter, you're talking about like 70% differences. So it's huge. It's not a small difference that we're trying to do. Yes? Um, but when you talk about dark matter, there's no question. The only interaction is gravitation. For now, for this simulation, yes. Could you infer something about kind of a drag force, very weak interaction between dark matter and not with our simulations, because our simulations are just gravity-based only. But there are other things, say, if, you're, if our fitting, you know, our comparison between the universe that we observed and the simulation pointed to something different from what we expect, then maybe we'll investigate further with a different model. But for now, we're actually just using you know, different dark matter density parameters for now. OK, so this is going to the realm of extrapolating instead of interpolating for the machine learning crowd here. OK? So we try to see whether it will work. So we just try. Can the learn model extrapolate and predict simulations that do not have the same latent cosmological parameters? OK, let's see whether it will do it. Can it extrapolate? So back to these crazy plots. I know it lost half the crowd once I showed it, but it's OK. Because it's important to do it very quantitatively in this field to be correct, uh, to also convince people. Um, we're going to show three different universes, so there'll be three different colors. Um, we have the solid line that will show the truth of the simulation, the short dashed line, which is the benchmark model, and the long dashed line, which is the machine learning model that we have. The benchmark model is not bad. It's just uh, it's the fast simulation that people still run, actually. And the top is the power spectrum, which is the Fourier transform of the correlation function. The middle part is just taking the power spectrum divided by the truth. So 1 is the best, it's 100%. The bottom is 1 minus r squared, r being the correlation coefficient. So it's the error power spectrum. So lower, the better. So closer to 0, the better. Let's show you. Let's see what happens. For all three different universes, which are using the same trained model, but different inputs, the different inputs are 10% dark matter, 50% dark matter. And you can see that basically it's impossible to tell. Just look at the solid line, it's the truth. But you actually can't find the long dashed line under the solid line. You have to really squint, and you probably can't see it. And if you can look at, if you can help yourself with looking at the transfer function, which is division of this long dashed line, which is our model, divided by the solid line, you can see basically fitting one all the way until a little bit here, which is very small scale on the right-hand side and large scales on the left-hand side. You can see the benchmark model is doing much worse. And here's the error power spectrum. And you can see that long dash line also doing very well. So this is very surprising. What happened? We don't need to overlap the training set with the test set. We did not explicitly use, you know, people who do machine learning will ask me, did you use transfer learning or meta learning or something along those lines? We did not. Maybe there's an overlap of information somewhere between these universes. Maybe. Or maybe the universe is fairly simple so that the generalization or extrapolation by the network is easy. Or maybe I'll finally get famous. That's most likely outcome. Uh, my possible climb to fame before I do this work is, um, I was taking this picture, and there are two very important people. The top one is important to me because it's my husband. The bottom is uh, Alice Honnold, who recently free climb uh, Yosemite's um, El Capitan, for those who know about climbing community. Um, so he climbed without ropes all the way up, I don't know how many thousand feet, by himself, and was in a documentary. I think it's also an Academy Award film now. And so they were climbing together. This is like five years ago. They were already climbing together. And I took this picture. I was like, OK, here's my climb to fame for sure. Because you know, my husband will climb really well. I'll be just like a photographer or something. Horrible one, obviously. Um, but maybe it's machine learning the physics of the cosmos. Maybe. Or maybe it's compressing the learned model into physical laws, which we didn't get to talk so much about. But you can see that the model has somehow learned 
how to go from you know particles swimming by each other to sort of like interact with each other. That has learned this over a gazillions of years. All these interactions are compact into this model. And it also worked outside the training set, which is very surprising. Or maybe we can discover new laws of nature if we compare the observed universe and all the different simulations. Maybe we discover something new. I'll be very provocative towards the end of the talk, always. Deep learning as a proximate simulator of everything. There are many things people are using deep learning to simulate right now, including what trains a self-driving car. So it's not just a self-driving car, it's doing deep learning. What's generating the, the training set for the self-driving car is also simulated. So maybe you should worry a tiny bit next time you see in Uber. Uh, actually, I think they did OK. I think someone actually just crashed their own Tesla. Uh, deep learning to learn the implicit physical model. Maybe there's a possibility to use this network to learn what is in the system as it approximates you know, these simulations. Is it possible to understand deep learning? That goes back to the question this earlier. Um, I think there is a way to do it. We don't know how to yet. There are a lot of effort in it. Um, physics might be one of these interesting playgrounds where you understand the rules and symmetries of the data that might help you understand the network. So there's also a possibility of that contributing back. Is deep learning a good candidate to us artificial general intelligence? This is what, like, I don't know, multi-billion dollar questions, I guess. Um, a lot of people believe it's true. It, you know, Google DeepMind and a bunch of other people like you know, Google Brain. We don't really know because we haven't got artificial general intelligence. And um, recently, there are a bunch of people I know who stopped their machine learning research because they're worried about the repercussion of how well you know, these things will be used or how, bad these, how badly these things will be used in you know, military and government surveillance situation. So maybe they won't even get there <laughs> because everyone will stop before that. <laughs> Can we replace physicists with deep learning so I don't get paid anymore? Um, that would be possible. We'll see. And I will take questions from that. Thank you. <laughs>